What's up, Johnny Franchise? How you doing? Great. I'm good, Mike. Hi. Thank you. Good to be here, man. Happy summertime. Happy summertime. Uh, great <laughs> to have you here. It's been a while. Um, everyone, I got I got John Francis here, or as we call him, Johnny Franchise. I've known John for a couple of years now, and you know he's doing great things in the franchise world. So, you know, I can, before I start rambling, John, you know, I mean. Johnny Franchise, John Francis, uh, Next Level Franchise. Why don't you tell everyone what you got going on in the franchise world? Yeah, well, th thanks, Mike. I um, I grew up in a franchise system, uh, literally. My parents were in the hair salon franchise. My dad was a barber, cutting that hair. Explains, and that, that explains why you got... Uh, <laughs> A well, nice hairdo going on. I still got it. So I'm I don't know like, how yeah. old you are, man. But I don't know how old you are. But uh, I'm I'm thirty. I'm thirty five, and and yeah. I'm and, and I'm jealous of you. If you can see why. Well, you right? know, I don't know. Mine's getting thick. I heard it now. It's not gray. It's called silver. It's so, yeah. There you go. You're a silver fox. I got a lot of it. It's coming fast. I got teenage daughters, so it's there all you go. good. <laughs> so I, I grew up here in Minnesota. My my dad was a barber cutting hair in the 50s, way back. Mm. And, um, you know, he was frustrated entrepreneur and he wanted to grow. And long story short, he, he and my mother created a brand called The Barbers here in the 60s before I was even born. And um, they were sort of franchising, I don't want to say accidentally, but it was like very early in franchising. There were hotels, gas stations, and restaurants at the time that were franchised, but really no one had done a barbershop or a, a beauty salon. And, and that's how it was. There were barbershops for men and beauty salons for women. So he franchised the barbershop concept uh, and it worked. And um, he, he had uh, sort of changed the industry by creating a business that could be duplicated to really run a barbershop efficiently and effectively and kind of a high end. He created a new sort of segment, I would say, and a new approach to being a barber and a business owner and really elevated the barber shop to a, a sophisticated business. And uh, so when I was growing up in the 70s, I thought everything was a franchise. I thought everybody worked for themselves, except the people that worked for us. And I thought everybody owned two or three companies. You know, isn't that just kind of, <laughs> yes, that's what I grew up with. So I'm the youngest of five kids. So by the time I was growing up, things were already going. It was busy time and family business, you know, all the time. And, and my dad was quite an entrepreneur, really solid guy, hard worker. And, and he took people with him. You know, he had quite a gift of sort of painting the picture and he was definitely a visionary. And um, so as I grew up and went to high school and went to college and, you know, I got a great education and uh, really got a lot of work experience early, early on. I, I, there was opportunity to, to get involved. And um, so I did. I worked real hard early on. And, and then, uh, again, long story short, the company grew and expanded um, in the 80s. When I was in high school in the 80s, the, the company developed a brand called Cost Cutters, which was like low end, quick service, no appointments, you know, a la carte pricing, which was new at the time. People weren't doing that in the industry. And that's when great clips and super cuts and it was kind of a race. Uh, our brand was cost cutters and it took off because we already had 200 salon owners with our existing brand, our first brand. So the second brand went like crazy. And then I got out of school and uh, went to work and started in uh, franchise sales and real estate because I had done some real estate work for our family, had some commercial properties. So um, I was in development and construction and then um, operations and distribution. Um, and I, I spent five years doing international franchising. Uh, we took some brands over to Europe in the 90s uh in in the western europe and then uh into russia in moscow i can tell you stories about uh being in that part of the world i spent a fair amount of time over in russia and, and all over that uh, ukraine and crimea and i've been to the black sea so i i, I kind of know the neighborhood where you are yep anyway we we had quite a run with that business it was big and successful and we worked very hard we had a great team of executives you know it wasn't just a family business but it was a big business and uh in the 90s then we did some acquisitions i got to do um uh, some regional acquisitions we bought other salon companies and convert them over and franchise them off and that became pretty good we worked with walmart when when the super center was a new concept and we go inside the walmarts with cost cutters in um 
that was a big deal, you know, uh, back in those days, it was new. And uh, there were a lot of traffic and exactly our customer demographic and, you know, families and quick service and good value. And uh, anyway, we sold that company, the franchise or, and uh, it was a large, we were NASDAQ listed. We had a thousand stores open and running and, and, and growing like crazy. We sold that in 1999. Um, so I was in my early thirties and uh, my dad had passed away. My mother took over and doubled the company. Then I had an older brother who died in a car accident. And so she wanted to retire, wound up selling the business. So we sold to Regis Corporation. And 25 years ago, that was a completely different organization. Mm -hmm. And we became their franchise division. So I worked there for nine months and I kind of got to take our company apart and put it back together inside of their company, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, they had 4,000 salons. We sold them another thousand and then became their franchise group. So they started franchising and getting better at their franchise, I would say. Uh, then I left there and took some time off because I had a, a, a fantastic non-compete, which was something I'd never had before and I knew I'd never have again. So um, I got to get paid to not work. It was unbelievable, right? You never have. dog. You love yeah, it was a rare, uh, unexpected. Anyway, I, I got involved then with a, a couple different brands. The, the biggest, most visible brand was PostNet, which is a business center kind of, at the time it was a competitor to Mailbox, etc. This was before the UPS store and uh, before Kinko's was owned by FedEx. And uh, PostNet was a, a couple of guys in Colorado and they're nice guys. I knew them through the IFA. I'd been going to IFA my whole life. and. Uh, so I got exposed to a lot of brands and a lot of people and a lot of opportunities. And I, I sunk my teeth into PostNet. I, I became a regional developer, an area representative, a multi-unit franchisee. And I ran with them for 10 years and we had a lot of fun and a lot of success. Uh, their company was growing and growing. The whole brand was strong and healthy. And uh, I had a good run here in Minnesota and Wisconsin was my territory. So we developed a ton of stores, sold a bunch of franchises, had a, had a lot of fun with it, frankly. A lot of good people, a lot of hard work, just like anything, you know. And then when the recession came through in 2009, 10, 11, you know, that, so 8, 9, when, it, when things were going insane, we were actually in Washington, D.C. at the IFA uh, conference in September when the whole meltdown was going on and people were, the whole... Um, you know, the Great Recession was happening. The banks and the Treasury Department were meeting over the weekend. That was totally insane. And we were there. We were in Washington while that was going on. And the whole financial market meltdown, you know, people were like freaking out. And uh, anyway, um, yeah, that changed the game for a lot of things. For a while there, you couldn't finance anything, right? Everything got frozen solid. Like nobody was borrowing. Every, and deals were off. I mean, everything just kind of went stop. And uh, so as a franchise developer, it was hard to get anything good, anything going. Nobody could borrow any money. Nobody was doing anything. So I transitioned, I sold my area contract back to corporate. We actually negotiated it over breakfast at the IFA conference in February of <laughs> the next year. <laughs> anyway, I went to work for the corporate office uh, for two years to help the, the brand in, you know, what I would call some strategic initiatives, right? They had some things that were doing well, but they had some things they could do better. And so I got to help clean up and, and work with them through some strategy and some structure and some accountability. Um, and I, that's, I got to implement a, a, a system called EOS, right? The whole traction thing. You've probably heard of this. It's pretty popular out there. I'd been working with it for a long time before that and had other clients that were using it and other brands. So along that time, when I was doing the post network and uh, we, I transitioned into real estate because commercial real estate became a real buyer's market. Uh, and here in the Minneapolis market where we, you know, we've been here forever and we know a lot of people I had the infrastructure. So, so we invested our family into some commercial industrial property. And I, I went in back to the real estate business, real heavy, but uh, I stayed in franchising as an advisor, as a board member, as a director. I serve on brands like Sport Clips, um, Office Pride, a Big Frog T-shirts, um, the largest or the third largest uh, Culligan water dealer in uh, in the country is a, is a family owned business based here in Minneapolis. 
Um, so I serve on a number of boards. I did some speaking. I developed some content, I guess, focused on helping other people get their franchising done right. Right. So it's like I, I've had I, I've been in and out of five different brands as a partner, as an owner, as a franchisor, franchisee, developer, whatever. I, I, I don't want to say I know it all. I, I don't know it all, but I'm a share it all. I know what I learned. I know what I did well. I had more wins than losses, I guess, but I, I learned from a lot of people doing a lot of work for a long time, right? 30 years in franchising. And uh, I, uh, I really just love it, frankly. I love to see when a franchise system is done well, when the franchisor does what they're supposed to do and the franchisees do what they're supposed to do and the suppliers and vendors really add value and do what they're supposed to do and everybody does what they really can do, it's a most powerful success machine I've, I've ever seen. If everybody wins. Yeah. And uh, I love how so, you said you got, you, you've had more wins than losses and everything that you yeah. just described right there. Well, because wins, losses, right? Like I, I, I love when people say, Oh, it's, it's good to take a loss because you learn from it. And, and that's true. But also, you know, you learn from wins and you learn from losses and whether yeah. you're winning or losing, you want to net, you know, you're net winning. And, and, and um, and and regardless, that means that you're playing the game and you're not sitting in the bleachers watching. And so yeah, you, you've you been keep in swinging. the franchise industry <laughs> winning, playing yeah, the game. It's a uh, you know, it's it's a it's nothing's easy. I'll, I'll say that. I mean, I could talk all day about franchise. But what I what I love about franchise is if you're a real entrepreneur, there's a place for you. And that's usually the franchise or right? If, if you're a better, more of an organized business operator and you want to just run a business and have a great job and a great business and really want to work hard and grow, you should be a franchisee, right? There's a place, if you've got a business that really can support that growth on the in franchise or, or the franchisee, there's room for you, supplier. There's so much opportunity in franchising. And, and what I'm starting to notice, you know, and maybe I'm just getting, uh, going off a tangent here, but I'm starting to notice where people show up, or I meet them somewhere, you know, I do my thing, I, I'm out and around at conferences and, and talking to people like you, and, you know, I've got clients and groups and all kinds of fun things I'm involved with. So I get around a little and sometimes I find someone who I think is really in the wrong spot, but they belong in franchise, but they're in the wrong place. And so maybe they should be a franchise or, or maybe they should be a franchisee. Or maybe they're in a supplier, but it's kind of the wrong, wrong structure or the wrong culture or somehow the wrong approach um, because they are not all the same. All the franchisors are not the same. All the franchisees are not. All the vendors, they're all not the same. There's so much uh, in terms of shape and size and growth and complexity and diversity and innovation and change. I mean, it, it's never ending uh, opportunity. It, it's a great universe to play in. And, and uh, well, I get to see and do and help where I think I can, you know, otherwise I kind of get out of the way, really. I don't want to buy anything. I don't want to sell anything. I don't want to work for anybody. I, I don't need a job. I don't need a new customer to, you know, do it. I want to help people where I think I can. So the work that I've been doing now, um, it really started late last year, um, is a concept uh, of peer groups, uh, mastermind group for franchisors. Um, and this is called Zor Forum, Z-O-R-F-O-R-U-M. And I'm technically a franchisee. Again, I'm the first franchisee. And uh, this is uh, work that I've done before. I, I, I used to be in a group, um, it was called The Inner Circle. And it was a like a Vistage or a YPO or an EO, a kind of organized mastermind peer groups, we called them back in those days. Anyway, I, I did that for 25 years and had a blast doing it. And, um, you know, I think you can learn from people so much. And, and when it's organized and structured, I mean, you're going to learn a lot more, a lot faster. So um, it was a uh, an important part of my my uh, development, I guess, as a young executive and as a business owner uh, for, for so many years through so many things. So this opportunity kind of came up last year and I've started to launch groups. I've got two groups and a handful of members in each group. And um, it's a monthly frequency where we meet and talk and share and we go deep. You know, it's not just simple kind of surface round table. Who do you use for this or how do you handle that? You know, we go into problem solving for these for these individuals and for their brand. 
And um, we get into some really complex and some really interesting stuff. And the good news is, you know, I'll share what I know, which may or may not be that relevant, but the other people in the group are involved and engaged and it's facilitated and organized. So the people who are there really do get a lot of support and a lot of ideas and different perspectives on solving their problem. And uh, we all, we can all learn from each other, right? If sometimes one guy has an issue and somebody else has an answer, uh, but everybody learns just from hearing it and listening, understanding it. You know, the debate and the discussion is really valuable. Yeah. So I've been having a lot of fun with those because that's kind of natural kind of work that I like to do. So serving on boards, advisory boards is something I found a niche, helping companies organize a board for their company. Um, and then uh, I guess I have some speaking. I, I, I work through an agent in, in Denver, Katrina Mitchell. Uh, who's fabulous and she's got a long uh, list of great speakers i think i'm i'm probably her lowest price inventory item on her website but <laughs> I, I do some occasional speaking i love to speak to brands like the whole brand at their conference and talk to the franchisees i have a, a program i developed called the franchise life cycle which is kind of basic but it, it takes a franchise owner through uh, four phases of growth so when you're new and just starting out, you're a baby toddler, you know, things are like this. And then you grow into a teenager phase, hopefully you get right through that. And then you become an adult in the business and, and how that looks and feels. And then the, the mature level, the, the legacy or the rock star is sort of the optional. So I talk about this whole process and what it looks like and feels like and what looks good and what looks bad and where your head should be and mindset and attitude. And, you know, I, I've done it so many times personally and I've helped so many people directly as franchisees and, and working through the franchise or sometimes, sometimes directly with the franchisees, but you know, there's patterns and systems and consistency. And um, I don't want to sound like, again, like I know it all, I don't know it all, but I like to help people when people are ready for some help and they're like, God, there's got to be a better way. Uh, you, you may not know everything, but, but, but there's a reason why on the streets you're known as Johnny Franchise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> someone has to give you a nickname, right? And um, so, so my name is John, but I'm the young, youngest of five. So I was Johnny, of course, Johnny. So everyone knows me as Johnny Francis. And then uh, a good friend of mine said, we were at a conference. He said, when I see your name, I just think Johnny Franchise. And, uh, and everybody laughed and, and it stuck, you know, that weekend. And um, so since then, you know, I guess it's my style. It's kind of straightforward, no nonsense. You know, I'm not, I got no hidden agendas. I'm not afraid to ask questions that might, uh, you know, make you think a little harder, make you a little uncomfortable. You know, when I do my work with my, my clients, you know, my goal is to help them see what they didn't see mm -hmm. and, and uh, see around the corner or make them think a little differently about what's coming and how they're going to respond or react. And, you know, I don't do the work. I, I, I help them do their work better. Yeah. And uh, it's so much fun to, to see the influence without the day to day. Uh, you know, I don't I don't want I, I'm home with my kids. I, I've been a, a work from home dad for for well, my oldest is 19. So, you know, since before she was born, so 20 yeah. years, it's a wonderful uh, option to be able to choose to work the way I do. And, and uh, I know that uh, you know, it's a lot of fun and uh, people uh, seem to like it. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. It's uh, I'm a lucky guy. You know? Absolutely. You know, it's it, the, like and why Zor Forum and, and, and I'm sure some of the consulting that you do um, under the next level franchise name. It's just amazing how all it really requires is a, a micro tweak. Uh, you know, uh, like people can be doing things like uh, a certain way and they're making progress but then just getting into that 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 mastermind setting with five to ten to fifteen other you know uh peers and just sharing and then just you know even if it's something that they've heard before but the way it's you know like it's just yeah it's it's those mic it's those micro tweaks that can result in massive business improvements and you don't get that unless you sur unless you unless you're in a mastermind setting like that you're, you're talking to others you're you're out there and yeah. you're networking um uh, it's 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 it, it's it's amazing those micro distinctions that can lead to success yeah and, and you know franchising is known for being open and people are willing to share and 
uh, you know, uh, supportive of each other. And that's genuine. That's wonderful. And, and like I said, I grew up thinking that's how everybody is. That's that's how we were. That's how everything I knew was. So to me, that's no surprise. But what I think the group format or like a board format does is takes that and really puts a structure to it that allows for even more effective sharing, right? It, it's a willingness to share is genuine, but the ability to share in a way that really makes a difference mm -hmm. is unique. And uh, so it kind of facilitates that and, and does it in a way that, that feels easy, you know? Lean um, into that a little bit more, like the, the, the uniqueness about it. Well, I mean, I go to conferences. I've been going to IFA conference for 30 plus years. I've been going to, you know, brand conferences. I bet I've been to a hundred different brand conferences over they my career. They start to be redundant. Yeah, I mean, it's the same sort of thing over and over and over. And, and what you see is um, people want to share and people are friendly and people are genuine, you know, connected to each other, which is really the fun part of the, you know, there's there's different sort of layers of, uh, of industry uh, connective connectedness. But uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is everybody has a genuine, sincere desire to help each other. They really do want to help. And sometimes you can sit with someone maybe for a couple hours and go through an issue and really talk about something and really get some insights, you know. Um, but that's rare, right? You have to make effort for that. You got to do that. And um, it's hard to do that at a conference, you know, unless you're out for dinner and then sometimes it's a distracted environment. and. You know, you're not, you know, you're building a relationship, but you're not getting the real value that you know is there. So the groups, the boards, um, the the speaking, that's where I can uh, sort of do my thing to facilitate that sharing of real, meaningful, important lessons and, and problem solving. You're not just talking about, you know, the surface kind of simple, short, uh, I would say shallow, easy stuff. You can do that in the bar, you know, uh, talking over a, a beer. That's easy. That's fun. But if you really want to make a difference, you really want to solve a problem. You want to you want to help move that person or that brand in the right direction. You know, you really need some structure, some time, and there's a way to do that. And uh, I think that's what I've discovered how to do. Whether it's working through a board of advisors or board of directors or these mastermind groups. You know, the people who are in there are there on purpose with intention and, and, a, and an organized way to extract that value that we're all kind of looking for. Right. And you've said it so many times and it's so important. Problem solving, problem solving, problem solving. That's yeah. what it's all about. That's what it's all about. You know, you're yeah. you're it's one thing to problem solve for for franchisors, franchisees. And a big part of it is helping them. How are they going to solve problems for their respective market? Because yeah. at the end of the day, that's value. If you're solving people's problems, if you're solving companies' problems, that's value. And you, John, have your decades, decades of experience. I, I just, every time I talk to you, I, I sense it, but, and that's what it is. It's like a sixth sense that you have. Like, I, I'm sure that you walk into these rooms, whether you're on the board of directors of this franchise or you're going into one of your mastermind settings and you've developed this six you you when you've been through it enough and you've had the, the experience that you have the track record that you have you have you can I, i'm sure i mean you tell me but like i'm sure within like a few minutes a few like three to five minutes if not less you pretty much know what the problem is and like know what what questions to ask and you get an idea of what's going on and and yeah. then getting that context allows you to start problem solving yeah, it, it is kind of fun. You know, I, I, I like to say I'm so familiar to me, most of these situations. And with a few questions and a little little understanding, you know, uh, I'm careful about what I say, right? So, uh, but what I think is um, is really fun, it, it's a way to actually, um, someone explained it to me. I, I was asking one of my clients, I've been working with this, this gentleman for a long time, five years. And, uh, and I said, you know, what is it? What do you get from working with me? Right. How do I? How do you explain me to anybody else? If I, if you, if I were to ask you for a referral, say, you know, how do I help you? What can you? What can I offer to the next guy who's like you? And he said to me, it, "You compress time." I said, "What does that even mean? <laughs> what are you talking about?" He says, "Because you talk to me and coach me and engage me." He said, "I'm thinking about things faster and quicker, and I'm making decisions." 
faster and quicker. And, and so you're just compressing the time it takes me to either succeed or fail or just to move forward so I can do more faster. It feels faster because it takes him less time. So he said, you're compressing the time for my growth and, and the business's growth. I said, oh, I never thought of it like that, right? It never occurred to me that that's, but that's the outcome for one of my good clients. And uh, he sees great value in that. And uh, I guess I do too. I hadn't seen it from that sort of point of view, but he said, by doing the work and the exercise and the, the conversations, you forced me to take action and, and hold me accountable. And it feels natural. You know, it's not a, it's, it's not an adversarial. I'm, I'm more like a coach or a, or a, uh, and I'll pull you or push you, depending on how you're feeling that day, <laughs> you know, because over time you get familiar, you get to know people. And 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 I guess I have an ability to to kind of cut through the crap and get to what matters and, and push it just enough to, to get you to do that thing that is next. And, you know, and I, I don't uh, I have a great ability to keep confidence. Um, and uh, I've had clients go through all kinds of stuff and I've been through it myself. You know, that's. I guess where I come from is like, I, I'm just constantly learning. And at the same time, it's it's all familiar, right? It doesn't seem like, uh, you know, I see a lot of crazy stuff, although I, I do. I'm just thinking of a client, I had a thing over the weekend, that uh, situation that we're dealing with now this week. And it's like, wow, I've never seen that before. So, you know, that's life, I guess. You learn as you go and, and I try to help where I can. and. Uh, I just love franchising. I really do. And I like to help people do what they're doing better because uh, it has such a ripple effect. You know, if, if one person gets it right, so many other people might get it right. And that helps so many. It's like this, you know, exponential point of leverage. So is that, really the is that where the love comes? I mean, of course, your background and like your, your family business and stuff. But I mean, uh, the love of of system building like like that's what i hear like when, when i just listen to you talk right there yeah. like the love of system building and and how when a system is built right right and, and it requires everyone in the uh, it's like a symphony orchestra and every every yeah. person in the orchestra needs to play their instrument and like when one or two of them you know when there's like a rusty flute you know ruined, but like when when everything is yeah. going right it's beautiful and, yeah, and, and the, even if you get close enough, it still sounds really good. You know, the, yeah. <laughs> the bigger right. the orchestra, the more complex. But, you know, and and the other piece of it is, um, you know, like I said, nothing's easy. But finding people in the right spot and knowing they're in the right place, to kind of, you know, take advantage of what they're really good at and the, the, the gifts they can bring to that role or that position. Uh, I think that's where I can really help people get out of uh, if they're stuck, you know, if they feel stuck. Uh, it's uh, it's refreshing to have a, a better point of view and a new opportunity that really fits you, because then yeah, you and it seems like you're you're helping people be self-aware. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, 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 and I mean, there's the great resignation going on, and it was before COVID. I mean, ageism is real, right? And automation and technology and offshoring is real, and and you know being like overworked and corporate is real and it's you know like people not spending time with their family is real and so i feel like there's it's really sexy to be a business owner and it's really you know like the, the franchise world is sexy it has an appeal because it offers that ability to be a business owner you know um and and and, and so i feel like a lot of people just want to go into it yeah and 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 they just kind of go into it just they just go into it and then and then the and then like once they're there they'll like then then there's a whole like hey i love being a business owner i know you love being a business owner we're both advocates of the franchise industry and it's great but it's also you know but it, it like you know it's like there there are you know you have to do things the right way or you know oh man like anything yeah. you know? and so i just feel a lot of people you know and so you know maybe someone's a an entrepreneur and they should be more of a franchisor Maybe someone's more of an operator. They're good at following direction. They should be a franchisee and people are, you know, maybe they should be a vendor. And so a big part of it is being self-aware. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think also realizing that um, nothing's as easy as it looks. You know, I, I think a lot of people come into franchising uh, a little unprepared, both, both as a franchisee uh, oftentimes and as a franchisor oftentimes. They they just go for it. They, they get excited and revved up and, and maybe they get the... Uh, connected to an excitable kind of, you know, people and, and bam, they're all of a sudden they're signing contracts and writing checks. And um, 
whether they're filing their FDDs and paying their registration fees or or they're a franchisee uh, putting down their deposit on a new lease or, or a new financing deal or whatever. Um, it gets real fast. And uh, so I like to make sure people know what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the commitment level is. You know, it's not just, uh, 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 some people plan their vacation more than they plan uh, their business, you know, and that's a, a opportunity, I guess. So I think that um, it, it looks easy, it looks fun, and, and it is easy in a sense, and it is fun if you're good at it, um, but not the first time. And, and there's certain tips and techniques and approaches that you can use that are, you know, kind of obvious, some of them, and some maybe not so obvious. Um, but I think franchising is a universe of, of uh, opportunity, as I mentioned. And I think there's some of this, uh, what I would call economic Darwinism in franchising, which means the ones that adapt survive. It, it's not always the biggest. It's not always the fastest. It's, those, I would say, the smartest and the, the ones that are willing to work together to collaborate. A, a collaborative culture is going to make it more than adversarial or, or, um, or contentious. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Anything that you see going on? I mean, uh, so 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 people as as you're as you're watching John and I right now. We're in August of 2022. John, you know where the world is today. I mean, any any trends you're seeing in the industry, uh, things that are concerning, things that are getting you bullish on franchising. Like like like, where do you see franchising? Like in the next, like like where we are with this current. Well, I, I, I think. I think right now, uh, everybody's kind of holding their breath to see what happens for the midterm elections, right? The, I think the politics are gonna ramp up. You know, inflation is high, interest rates are still, you know, just went up again. So things are probably cooling off in terms of, uh, you know, the stock market is lousy, so people don't feel rich. Uh, you know, home equity, who knows? I, I don't think we're gonna have a big adjustment, but I don't think it's gonna keep going as crazy as it has. And, uh, so I think the economy is, is going to have a big impact. But I, what I'm also seeing is there's no shortage of new brands coming online. I, I follow emerging brands and there's there's so many and there's they're all over the place. And, and so, you know, the, what what uh, I guess bothers me is the what I'll call the carnage factor in, in emerging franchise systems where they might get 10 or 20 or 50 or 60 or whatever. They get close but they don't really get to that sort of seems like that hundred unit mark is kind of the magic, which is sort of arbitrary because some are very successful with less than that and others are, are not successful with a lot more. So, but generally making it past that startup phase to where you're a brand that's uh, royalty self-sufficient, right? Where you can, you can run your business based on your fee structure and you don't have to sell your way to growth. You know what I mean? It, oh yeah. That's a milestone. There's a there's a trigger point, a tipping point where things really get interesting when you hit that level. Well, I look yeah. at a lot of FDD uh, item 21s, yeah. and I always get concerned with those brands that you know their their trajectory of uh, franchise fee revenue is is going up and up, but the royalties are like you know decreasing. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a, always a red flag. It doesn't mean that it's a doomsday all the time, but it means to me what that says at a very macro level is that they're 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 more focused on like on selling and less focused on making sure that they're taking care of their existing franchisees. Right, right, and I guess that's my point. Is I I see that too. I, I see a lot of new brands, a lot of new people doing some really cool things, uh, but I see a lot of focus on just growth, just right. grow, 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 sell, 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 and and I caution them to say you know. Uh, Really, the, this is a tortoise and the hare kind of thing. You know, you want to be slow, steady, consistent, and uh, that'll pay off in the long run uh, rather than just, you know, spectacular. Right. Uh, you know, and so we, I get to see a lot. And so I, there's no shortage of, of new opportunities and there's no shortage of carnage, which is just bothers me, right? Because yeah. it, it feels like it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, but I guess that's the world, right? People. Well, you really know, a lot of people have to blame themselves, and, I, and and what I mean by this is this: like, th this is what I mean by that. Um, you know, this is a very general assumption, but you know, there is a lot of carnage. You're a hundred percent correct, and and so how do you, like how do you how do you partake in the success stories as opposed to the carnage stories? Right, a big part of it. Like you you said, I I'm you know taking notes as you talk, John. There's a lot of fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. I love the economic darwin economic darwinism 
uh, um, uh, um, comment that you made because you know Zor Forum is is a uh, like joining a a, a friend you know like joining your concept like a Zor Forum with you know a mastermind setting for franchisors you know working with a CPA. Um, a yeah. team of advisors like me. These are things, you know, because like economic Darwinism, the best will survive, regardless of what's going on in the economy. There's going to be ups and downs in the economy, but you know, those that are going to uh, survive are the ones that are, you know, doing the things, you know, that that are doing the things that everyone else is not doing. Right? Surrounding right. yourself it, with people it, that, that know things, you know. Yeah. So you're in a mastermind setting. You're with advisors. You're you're. But a lot of the market, they start to has. I don't want to pay the. I don't want to pay the extra X amount of dollars and fees for that consultant. I think I can figure it out on my own and stuff like that. I mean, you need to have mentors. You need to get other perspectives. You need to surround yourself yeah. with people that are better than you in a good way. And, um, and, and so like, that is like, like doing things like surrounding yourself with mentors and with, with consultants, you know, being part of mastermind, like that is part of, you know, we can't guarantee anything, right? But you, but but like you know, you as an advisor, me as an advisor, uh -huh. we can in, increase the chance of our clients being successful. Definitely, yeah, I, I agree 100. I think what you're saying is, uh, I would call it a smart move. You know, what's a what's another smart move? You got a good lawyer, a good accountant, a good advisor, a good whatever. You know, smart move, right? These are smart moves. People people make smart moves. People make dumb moves. Um, I've, I've seen it and I've done it. You know, everybody has their uh, steps forward and their steps backwards and so on. But uh, I, there are some obvious things that, and, and you know, the, the, the world is so connected now. There's, it's so easy to share and and, uh, and learn about different things and try different things. Uh, and I think, you know, not, not one thing is for everybody. You know, there's so many people doing so, but it's all good. I, I have this abundance attitude, right? Like. There's there's so much opportunity for everyone. Who, if you 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 kind of get what you deserve, I think generally, and and what you put out is what you get back. So, so I I think that um, what you're saying is true. Though you know the ones that are going to be successful are the ones that deserve to be successful. So they have the right uh, integrity. They have the right motivation. They have they work hard. Right. They don't quit. They don't cheat. They don't lie. They don't. Uh, you know they're not. Uh, they're not stupid, right? They 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 make smart moves and they 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 do the right thing, and they have good people. You know, sometimes it is just people, and um, that's why it's you know never ending universe of opportunity because there's so many people and, and things change and life goes on. And anyway, I, I think it is um, it's a fun to have that broad perspective and see yeah. things from that level and and recognize that uh, you know there is a lot of opportunity, and I, I just want to help people be successful where they where they are where they're going and sometimes they need some advice uh that might not be easy but uh you know they understand it like this this is valuable i need to listen to this or consider it at least so yeah i like to say i don't tell people what to do i help them figure out what they need to do i don't do, i don't do the work i don't take the credit it's it's not my job it's it's my opportunity to help others do what they're trying to do better amazing well, John, um, always a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Um, for you know our audience of franchise industry professionals, franchisors, um, how can they find you? Well, my my nickname is Johnny Franchise, so that's my website. Uh, I'm on all the social media stuff. Uh, not hard to find. Um, I live in Minneapolis. Uh, the Zor Forum is a is kind of the mastermind group. That's I, I'm my, my focus area. Uh, and then everything else that I do is kind of depends on the opportunities and, and the situations. But uh, happy to talk to folks. Um, I'll be at uh, the IFA's Emerging Franchise Conference in November. I got invited to speak there. Um, I'll be with the Franchise Business Review. They're having a franchise summit in uh, in Nashville in November. I'll, I'll be there. I'm a sponsor. Um, I'll be at IFA in, uh, I think it's in Las Vegas in February. Uh, you know, who knows? There's there's so many opportunities and it's just fun to be around. And So anyway, I'm happy to, happy to be here with you, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to share and talk and, and just kind of explore these ideas. Some big ideas, you know, but uh, I think um, it's just fun to talk and share and connect. So I, I really appreciate it.
Well, John, the feeling is mutual, my friend. You know, everyone, franchise industry, success story, franchise industry winner, overall good person, John Francis, a.k.a. Johnny Franchise. John, thank you so much for being on. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Take care.